We're going to continue in the book of Acts. I so hope you've been enjoying it and challenged by it. Uh, it's been a joy to work through it together and, and study it together. And r- really, my prayer for you through this is that you would realize one simple thing, is that through the filling of the Holy Spirit and the work of God in your life, you would realize that you have everything that you need to be a part of his mission in the world. And as we come to the end of this book, and we're going to finish it up in the next several weeks, uh, Paul is also coming to the end of not only his ministry, but his life. And we talked a little bit about that last week. One of the things that we haven't necessarily focused on, but is a reality for us today as we're in Acts chapter 21, is Paul's determination in the midst of every other place that he went, through Asia, through Macedonia, into Achaia in Greece, to Ephesus, Thessalonica, Philippi, uh, Corinth, all of these places that he went, in the midst of his calling to share the good news with those who were Gentiles, non Jewish people. He still maintained this deep, fiery passion for his brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith and tradition to know that Jesus really was their promised Messiah, their promised Savior. And he was determined and knew that the Lord was leading him to go back to Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 19, he says, I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem and then maybe eventually to Rome as well, which we know he actually does end up in Rome where he dies. And then in Acts chapter 20, as he's kind of sharing with those that he loves, um, kind of this last these last words, his last will and testament to them before he goes to Jerusalem, he says in chapter 20, verse 22, now I'm bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what lays ahead of me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. He realizes that if he chooses to do this, it's not going to be an easy path. It's going to be a very costly path as well. And so he makes his way back from Europe, back from Asia, and lands on the coast to make his way inland to Jerusalem. And in chapter 21, he encounters some believers who say to him, Paul, don't go. We know you want to go, but, but don't go. And in fact, there's a prophet who comes up out of the region around Jerusalem, a guy named Agabus, who uh, takes Paul's belt which is a weird thing, like somebody just zips your belt right off of you, but this guy does it, takes his belt and binds his own feet and hands with it and says, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be in chains. You're going to be bound to yourself. And Paul is yet so convinced and burdened for his own people that he's willing to pay the cost. In fact, we get a glimpse of how determined he is in the book of Romans. Most likely, he wrote this book in the city of Corinth in this last missionary journey before he went back to Jerusalem. And you, you can see the, the recentness and how compelled he is in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. He says, "'With Christ is my witness,' I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. And then catch this. He says, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ myself, if that would save them. You you hear the agony in this. This is, we read a lot of the New Testament trying to figure out the theological nuggets that we can pull out and apply to our life, but in this, we hear the humanity of Paul for his Jewish brothers and sisters. Listen, if it means I'm damned and go to hell myself so that they would be saved, so be it. So be it. And he is willing to go knowing 
that Jerusalem is not a safe place for him. And so he arrives in Jerusalem, and he encounters the Christians that are there, the, the Jewish Christians, and they say to him, we're so glad that you're here. We hear that God is doing amazing things among all people all throughout the world. But while you're here in Jerusalem, we know that many people who are following Jesus still follow the law of Moses and well, as well. And so in order not to make things more difficult for you, even among Jewish Christians, would you go to the temple and fulfill some vows? And Paul is willing to do that. But even though he's willing to be all things to all people, right? And he's willing to embrace this. He finds himself at the temple. He finds himself the center of a riot. Jews from all over the city come and uh, begin to speak against Paul, say that he's a blasphemer, and they uh, attempt to not only beat him and strike him, but they plan to kill him. And because Jerusalem is still taken over by uh, the Roman nation. The Romans enter in, and they separate this riot, and uh, Paul is experiencing the difficulty, and now he's taken in chains, as was prophesied. And he gets ready to publicly address the crowd, this riot that his Uh, gathered before him. And you can't help but read this near the end of this book and see the parallels with Jesus's life as well, right? That as Jesus was ministering around the Judean region, around Jerusalem, and in Galilee, he felt compelled as well that during the Passover celebration, he too had to go to Jerusalem, knowing that there would be a mob, a crowd, speaking against him and eventually yelling out, to crucify him and to crucify him. I don't know if this was the same people or if this was the next generation of people. It's been a few decades since Jesus was crucified, but now Paul's in Jerusalem and another mob forms and they shout out, kill him, kill him, kill him. And Paul prepares to share with those that God has laid on his heart, that he would be willing to die and go to hell himself if it would mean that they would hear the truth about Jesus and believe. And that's where we pick up at the end of Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, verse 40, it says this, the commander who had taken Paul prisoner agreed So Paul stood on the stairs and motioned to the people to be quiet. And soon a deep silence enveloped the crowd. He addressed them in their own language of Aramaic, which was a Hebrew dialect. You can't help but wonder if, as this mob was roaring to have Paul killed and they are silenced, it's deafening. It's overwhelming to the entire city. And Paul might stand there before he speaks and whisper Jesus' words that say, all right, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witness in Jerusalem. Maybe he whispered a quick prayer and said, I know you'll never leave me. I know you'll never forsake me. And Paul begins to speak, and he says in chapter 22, verse 1, he says, Brothers and esteemed fathers, listen to me as I offer my defense. When they heard him speaking in their own language, the silence was even greater. And then Paul said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, and I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. As his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you here today. And I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify that this is so. 
For I received letters from them to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the followers of the way from there here to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. As I was on the road, Approaching Damascus about noon, a very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the voice replied, I'm Jesus, the Nazarene, the one who you are persecuting. The people that were with me saw the light, but didn't understand the voice speaking to me. I asked, What should I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told everything you're to do. I was blinded by the intense light and had to be led by the hand to Damascus by my companions. A man named Ananias lived there. He was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law and well regarded by all the Jews of Damascus. He leaves out. He also was a follower of Jesus to this Jewish audience. He came and stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And that very moment, I could see him. And then he told me, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one, speaking of the promised Messiah, and hear him speak. For you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. There I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, Hurry, leave Jerusalem, for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. But Lord, I argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and kept the coats they took off when they stoned him. But the Lord said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened until Paul said that word. Then they all began to shout, Away with such a fellow! He isn't fit to live! They yelled, threw off their coats, and tossed handfuls of dust into the air, which meant they were ready to kill him. What Paul models here as he enters into Jerusalem, compelled by love and compassion for his Jewish brothers and sisters, is the reality that every story matters. He leveraged what we see very popular today, and that's telling the story of the before and after, right? You may have seen this, friends who are trying to sell you the latest, latest diet fat or something. They're like, hey, here's the before picture and the after picture. You might be remodeling your house, and you're like, don't forget to take the before picture and the after picture because we want to compare and contrast the effects of the work that we've done. And so whether it's weight loss or muscle gain, before and after is a compelling tool in our story. And Paul realizes He realizes this, that the most powerful tool he has in order to share the truth of Jesus with his Jewish brothers and sisters is not a sharp theology or amazing apologetics. It is the power of his story. Paul, who was educated by the best Jewish rabbi in the day, he could have come in and he could have argued with them from Scripture that Jesus truly fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. He could have, in a compelling way, as he had done, uh, arranged how God's activity in the world through the Jewish people culminated in Christ himself, and that he was raised from the dead was proof that he was the Messiah. But it wasn't that that Paul used. It was the power of his story. Paul realizes, or Paul understood, that if Jesus would save him, He would and could save anyone. No one is beyond God's love and forgiveness. Funny enough, Paul actually repeats this idea over and over again in the letters that he writes. In his letter to Titus, which was his friend and co-worker that he left to lead the church on the island of Crete, 
He says this, Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Paul was talking about the before and the after. In his letter to the church in Colossae, he says this, This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the insurance you believe when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. You were one way, and now through Christ you're another. And his, church, his first letter to the church in Corinth, he says this, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, or who worship idols, or commit adultery, or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will enter or will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy. You are made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul often leveraged the reality of who people were before Jesus and compared and contrasted it to who they were now after they had put their faith in Jesus and been cleansed and transformed and given a new life. In fact, the before and after of life change in, in the disciples is one of the most compelling reasons to believe that Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection are actually true. That it's not just a made-up story uh, or a fairy tale. Peter, who was one of Jesus' closest followers, was transformed from being a fearful denier on the night of Jesus' crucifixion to the leader of the initial wave of this new movement that swept through Jerusalem. Paul himself, as he already shared in this story, was the primary persecutor of the way, these followers of Jesus, and he became the primary proclaimer of the truth and reality of Jesus to the rest of the world. In fact, almost all of Jesus' followers were persecuted and brutally killed because of their faith in Christ. If it wasn't real, if it was just made up, if it was a myth, if it was as true as Jack in the Beanstalk, nobody's going to die defending that. Unless it's true, right? Right? unless it's true. Only then would you be willing to be beheaded or crucified upside down or have boiling oil dumped on you while you are still alive. It's a compelling reason, the before and after of the disciples. And so, this leads us to this reality. Sharing your story is the most powerful tool you have to be a compelling witness to those in your life who are doubtful and questioning struggling and hopeless, lost and alone. Your story matters, no matter what your story is. Your story matters, no matter what your story is. It doesn't matter if you have a story like Paul, who was 
you're dead set against Christianity and Jesus, and maybe you spent some part of your life trying to convince others that this thing wasn't true at all, but then you encountered God uh, through a dream or through the truth of his word or through somebody else who entered into your life right when you needed it, and you became convinced and changed and transformed. It doesn't matter if you lived a life of addiction and brokenness, you came from a family who uh, was difficult or even uh, damaging to your life. But then you met Jesus, and he reminded you how much he loves you and wants to adopt you into a new family and set you free from all of those things and help you heal those wounds. It doesn't matter if you grew up in the church. And you feel like, well, I haven't really done any of those things. I haven't really drifted. I've kind of been living the straight and narrow. I've trusted that what Jesus has said and the Word is true for my entire life. It doesn't matter. Your story matters. Everybody's story matters, no matter what your story is. Let me explain why this is true and so important. And what I think is actually compelling about what Paul was sharing about his story. I don't know about you, but I was raised in uh, a church, and one of the things I heard was, listen, don't talk too much about your past because you don't want to give the devil too much credit. I'm like, Paul doesn't seem to have a problem talking about his past, and I wonder if we realize we haven't allowed Jesus to heal us completely if we do have a problem talking about our past. In fact, I think Paul would say it's important for us to remember the part of our story of who we were before Christ. And I'm not just talking about when you trusted in Jesus for the first time, right? Your story is more than a single event in your life. There is that, and it's compelling, and it's transformative, and it redirects your life. But it's then also the daily moments when we realize this area of my life, I actually— have not trusted God to save me or uh, sanctify me or cleanse me or heal me in this area. And so that's part of your story as well. Before Jesus had access or lordship over that part of your life. So remembering who you were before Christ is so important to do. And if you haven't spent time reflecting and thinking about who you were before you put your trust in Jesus or who you were before you allowed Jesus access and control in a specific area, even after you became a believer, it is so important to your story for two reasons. One, remembering who you were before Christ should bring you encouragement. It should bring you encouragement, not shame and not guilt, but encouragement because here's the truth. You are not who you used to be. Isn't that good news? I'm not who I used to be. You are not who you used to be. And often when we feel stuck or discouraged in our walk with Jesus, remembering who we were before Jesus had control or before Jesus saved us encourages us to say, yeah, but I'm not back there anymore. I'm not who I want to be. I'm not at the end yet. I'm not totally who God wants me to be yet, but I'm not back there. Look how far I've come with Christ. Looking at your past should bring you encouragement too. Remembering who you were before Christ should also bring humility. Right? I'm not who I used to be, but I did used to be that. Right? I'm not trying to hide it. I'm not trying to make excuses for it. I'm not trying to blame others. I, I have not done this on my own. Who am I to take credit for how far I've come? This is the work of God through Christ in my life. Remembering my past brings encouragement. I'm not who I once was, but it also brings humility that God actually loved me when I was like that. Can you imagine? And what that does, it increases our compassion for other people. Often we find ourselves as believers, if you've been following Jesus for a long time, especially if you haven't been in the practice of remembering where God has brought you from, we create distance to other non-believers. You're like, I can't imagine anybody that would do that. And Jesus is like, you did that. 
you used to be that way. You may not have behaved in the same way, but your heart was just as selfish or dirty. And so it brings humility. Remembering who we were before we uh, were saved by Jesus or allowed Jesus access and control in specific areas. Also, there's the before and there's the after. Remembering who you are now in Christ. We can't just look back. We have to look into now, into the future, that Jesus did save you. Jesus is at work in your life. And as we sang, sometimes it doesn't feel like he's working, or sometimes he's not working in specific areas as fast as you want him to work, or your spouse wants him to work, whatever the case may be. He's still at work shifting and changing your priorities and motivations. And so not only do we look at who we were before Christ and have encouragement and humility, but we look at who we are now in Christ, and it brings new purpose. Paul says, I, I was the chief persecutor of the way, man. I had, I had letters of official letters. I could go and imprison and kill any Christians that I wanted to. And when he encountered Jesus, Jesus gave him a new purpose. I have a new mission for you and new motivations for you. It's always funny that Jesus speaks to those that he calls uh, based on kind of who they are, right, is to Peter, who is a fisherman, he says, yeah, I know you used to fish for fish, but now I'm going to have you fish for men. And he leverages that purpose, and he breathes new life into it, and he says it's not going to be so different, but it's going to be different enough that it's going to feel like a totally new life. Remembering who you are now in Christ brings purpose, and also it brings compassion. I was once where you are, but through Christ. We look at one another, and we look at those who are far from God, and we say, I was once where you were. I know exactly what you're going through. But through Christ, I'm changed, transformed. I was rescued. I was redeemed. I was healed. I was comforted. I was given peace. I was reconciled. I was hopeful. It drives compassion when we remember who we are now in Christ. Just like Paul understood as he entered into Jerusalem, knowing it was going to be very costly, as you enter this week, whether that's your family that may be struggling or resistant to faith in Jesus, maybe it's your workplace, maybe it's uh, somewhere else, know this, that the most powerful tool you have is sharing your story because your story matters no matter what your story is. And that's why we celebrate baptism here, the way we celebrate baptism. Uh, and we're going to baptize some folks this fall, and so if you're interested in being baptized and sharing your story of who you were before you met Jesus and who you are now that you've met Jesus, we would love to celebrate that with you. Baptism isn't the key to your salvation. It's the external celebration of the decision that you've made to follow Jesus. And so we'd love for you to be a part of that. Just talk to me after the worship service if you're interested in that. Your story matters. Your story matters. Who needs to hear your story this week? Who needs to hear your story this week? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for Paul, who is so compelled by your spirit to, to brave what is inevitable danger and difficulty and chains in order to share his story with those that not only he loved, but he knew you love, that you sent Jesus to die for. That even though throughout the decades that we've been remembering in the book of Acts, that it was uh, Jewish people who were regularly bringing persecution against followers of Jesus, he still said, no, no, no. no. If, if Jesus could save me, he could save anyone. Let me tell you how he did it. Lord, there's people that were thinking about this week, or there's situations that we're going to enter into this week, and uh, maybe they've been difficult, or maybe we've been praying that you would open doors 
And I pray that you would make it very clear and give us an opportunity this week to share a portion of our story that I used to be so worried about what other people thought that it drove my behaviors to poor choices and addiction and being enslaved to my perception of other people. And yet when I met you, you set me free from that. I became only concerned about what you say about me and who I am in Christ. I've been able to put aside the fear of other people's perceptions or whatever your story is, how God's transformed you and is transforming you in the big areas and in the small areas. Lord, would you open a door for us to share our story because it's really your story and it's the story of what you want to do in all people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.